So there, coming up this evening, we will in parts pick through the bones of Denmark nil, Ireland nil. We were just talking there, over six and a half hours of football now without Ireland managing to score a goal. Something funny's going on there, is it me? Is that my mic? Is it my headphones banging off my mic? It's Richie, they're putting the blame on you, Rich. Rich, it's all on you. Sorted out whatever's going <laughs> over there now. Uh, Mike Carlson talks NFL, namely uh, last night. It was record-breaking last night, the highest scoring Monday Night Football in history, third highest game scoring game of all time. Just why offences are so on top this season. One of the things we'll put to Mike. And then Tiger versus Phil. You know what I'm talking about, for the most part. Uh, this Friday, it's Tiger versus Phil. We will try and uh, think of a sporting pay-per-view event that people have cared less about. Text in if you can think of one five three one zero six. the uh, text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Richie, have you fixed your mic? think so. Okay, good. Dave McIntyre, what's know. rare is wonderful. Welcome. How are we doing? Of an evening as well. Yeah. Have Delighted to be your, here. Have you, have you spent your day, feet up? Um, no, and I didn't have my feet up, but I gym. didn't have work to do and I didn't have children, so... I know you don't want to talk about your gym regime, but you were in the gym, weren't you? Well, obviously. Yes, obviously. I mean, look he was at telling good. me just before we came on air how his gym regime has actually been extended by his lady of leisure status over the past <laughs> couple of weeks. It's a hell of a <clears> life <throat> he's managed to carve no, out for himself. The, on the gym side of things, it's just great to be working out pain-free. That's really the, <laughs> it's the great part about it. <laughs> But uh, you get have a bit more time on a, the early part of the week, yes. On and on Champions League week in particular. Be far more busy next week. I may, I may or may not give you a chance later on to talk about Raymond van Barneveld's retirement. Uh, one of the greats. It's you're a sad day for world sport. You're a big darts fan. Yeah. And I'm sure you've been watching with interest the scandal which has uh, wreaked havoc on the sport over the last number of days. I read from The Guardian here. <laughs> Uh, the world of professional darts has been rocked, that's rocked Dave, I'm sure you've seen this story, <coughs> by two players accusing each other of repeatedly breaking wind during a match. <laughs> that's Gary Anderson of Scotland and the Dutchman Wesley Harms. They blamed each other for, quote, rotten farts <laughs> during the clash <laughs> in the Grand Slam of darts. So Anderson, twice world champion, <coughs> of course, uh, won the match 10-2 earned a place in the quarterfinals, but in a post-match interview, his uh, beaten opponent, Harms, said that his own poor form, he wasn't at his best, Harms, his own poor form was due to Anderson breaking wind on stage and leaving, quote, a fragrance, fragrant smell. <laughs> he said, it'll take me two nights to lose this smell from my nose. Anderson heard this, was not impressed. He laid the blame at Harms' door. And then Harms came back again. If the boy Anderson thinks I've farted, he's 1,010% wrong. Very specific. <laughs> The next line's the best. I swear on my children's lives that it was not my fault. <laughs> and he says, I had a bad stomach once on stage before, but I admitted it. So I'm not going to lie about farting on stage. How many times in top-level sport have somebody's children's lives been sworn upon that somebody did not suffer a bed of flatulence? Not often. So there's a certain logic there. He says he's admitted it before. It's not totally watertight, but anyway. Anderson, the world number four. Use that term. Uh, the world number four, he hit bat gave extraordinary details as The Guardian, he blamed it on Harms. He said, no, it definitely came from Tableside, and it was eggs, rotten eggs, but not from me. <laughs> he said, every time I walked past, there was a waft of rotten eggs, so that's why I'm thinking it was him. It definitely wasn't me. And then Anderson went on to say that he has farted on stage before, but never used it as an advantage. <laughs> Imagine it was a tactic. Well then, um, it's like oh no, my form isn't great here. I'm just going <laughs> to eat a load of beans and have a raft of stout. Well then, PDC chairman Barry Hearn uh, said he had never heard of deliberate farting during a match, but he said I'm determined to get to the bottom of this. How exactly? PDC. I wish you right. could something stinks about this story. Oh dear, <laughs> fantastic stuff. Now I think darts. I mean, everybody. look, you do whatever it takes to win. That's true. They're competitors. And if you are feeling a little um, peckish or a little. Um, a little bit ill. You want to be doing it just as you're leaving the hockey, just as you've thrown your three darts, mm -hmm. so that your opponent walks straight into it as he's preparing for his throw. Yeah, it's a particularly contentious Grand Slam because the issues between Anderson and Gerwin Price in the final as well, in terms of walking across the other's line of sight at the hockey while the other was preparing to take their uh, next three throws. So it's nice to see a bit of uh, liveliness going into the world of darts. It can get very touchy. Aside. I was just going to say, there's lots of tetchiness in darts. Yeah, there's been a few relationships over the years that have provided an awful lot of entertainment. A lot of them have involved Phil Taylor. Um, I was just, because I was looking up the Gary Anderson interview after that semi-final of the night, and it's just looking up like random angry darts interviews. I'm not lying when I say about eight out of nine that came up were just Phil Taylor interviews, and all of them different, because he was a very yeah. angry, He's angry had a man. problem with a, a large degree of people over the years, but they do 
particularly when the pressure's really on, like these guys are playing for their livelihoods. A lot of them are playing to stay inside the t- uh, top 12 and retain their automatic seating for some of these biggest tournaments. And there's an awful lot of money that they're playing for. And they, they do tend to lose their rag every so often. And they're very honest in their post match interviews, yeah. really honest, probably more so than you get in any other sport. There aren't many platitudes. If they're praising somebody, you can pretty much tell that it's genuine, although you have often watched Taylor praising his opponent over the years and you know that it's really not genuine. Because I was just um, thinking, as you said, that it was about a year ago when Phil Taylor went off and won. I think it was Daryl Gurney who didn't pour him a glass of water, yeah. poured himself a glass of water, and this was a big sign of disrespect, and Phil really went to town on him afterwards. It was a big, yeah, t- it was yeah. a big scandal in the sport for about 24, 48 hours. Should he yeah. have poured the glass of water? <laughs> what does it mean that he didn't? And that's the kind of thing they miss now that the power's gone, and... Um, on a serious note, like for darts lovers out there, in particular lovers of the PDC, <clears throat> it's not a good situation to have Taylor and Barneville stepping away so close in succession. Obviously, Taylor's last World Championship was the 2018 World Championship. Mm-hmm. Barney's last one is going to be the 2019 World Championship. And unless he comes back and plays in January 2020, I'm not sure, because I know next season is his last. But they were the two biggest personalities in the game outside of Van Gerwen, and they're both gone now. No, it's this championship uh, is going to be Barney's last. This is his yeah, last. This is his right. last one, 2020. So, you know, yeah. on a serious note, what Barry Hearn has built this empire on mm-hmm. has been one of the best rivalries in sport. It's Van Varnemeld and Taylor. They're both gone now. So. And in their absence, what steps forward? Well, Van Gerwen is a real character and people love watching him play because he's so explosive and he is incredibly honest in his interviews as well. Not afraid to throw a tirade or two if necessary. Um, but outside of him, I mean, there aren't really big characters there anymore. It's not like, like nice guys like some yeah. Sulevich, the likes of Rob Cross who won the World Championship last year. Like They're solid blokes but there's not mes- necessarily like there's characters like Peter Rice, there's p- characters like uh, Simon Whitlock um, but beyond that like it, uh, it's kind of nice to see Gerwin Price throwing his weight around this week at the Grand Slam because it adds a little bit of extra free song going into the World Championships because he's somebody who on his day can probably pull off at one of the top ranking events and but if you were to ask anybody in six months time mm. name two of the highest profile players in the PDC mm. with Taylor and Van, Van, Van Barneville gone anyth- anything other than a casual or s- anything other than a serious darts fan like a casual yeah. darts fan would not be able to give you an answer your casual viewer would struggle to tell you Rob yeah. Cross won last year so um that's, I think, is just a little bit of a challenge to have because Taylor's carried the sport for so long yes. and Barnabell right, right beside him on that. But um, it's, it's an odd one that we've managed to spend the last 10 minutes talking about the PDC Bloody in God. November. Good. Are, are, is the new batch of dark player just uh, players we haven't got to know yet and over time they'll have huge profiles or are they a different breed? Are they nicer young men? I hope so because like Taylor's personality and everything else and his actual talent dominated the sport for so long mm. so he took up so much real estate in terms of how it was spoken about yeah. and who actually won the bloody things. You'd know. Do you watch much? You're still watching a good Not bit, as much you? as I would have done in, the, in years gone by. Okay. But, and mainly because Taylor's not there. Daryl Gurney's a good character, actually. Yeah. And I mean, one of those I'd people ask, who's like... If really Daryl Gurney like walks into any room yeah. outside of a darts-related room... Davey's wearing a shirt called Super Chin, out. and he has a massive chin, <laughs> so you're going to notice him. Like, Gurney is... He's just one of a number of guys, mm-hmm. but he's not like the, like the standout guy. Mm. Take Van Gerwen out of it. There isn't really anything else coming up behind him that's going to force you to go... Like, I would never go and watch the Premier League anymore because um, Taylor's not there and Van Barneveld is not there. Right. Like, Taylor is the Tiger Woods of darts. Like, yeah. all of the players nowadays, just like the top golfers now, they owe their living. The fact that, you like, a regular PGA Tour event is going to give you at least a million dollars for the winner's check, like the Travelers Championship mm. or something that anyone who doesn't watch golf regularly wouldn't have a clue about. That's all down to Tiger, mm. and he Taylor has done the exact same for darts, and these guys owe him their living right now. The winner of the 2019 World Championship is going to walk away with £350,000, which is an enormous amount of money, and that has trebled in the last eight years. It's an astonishing amount. It's all down to him. Right. I don't know who the next Taylor is to try and keep that going, try and keep that gravy train going, um, but I guess Barry Hearn's come up with that challenge and met it before. He just has to do it again. Has the younger generation started a health kick, like going to the gym and drinking protein and pretending that physicality is very important to them? Uh, you'd look at price and suggest, yeah, but beyond that, I don't think so. Okay. There's These guys are not added. in good shape. Okay. No, but Even they the don't, younger. like, they probably look after themselves a bit better in that... They're not they the Jockey Wilson generation. They're not a the Jockey Wilson generation. They would see getting enough sleep as vitally important. Yeah. They probably do eat a bit better than the darts players of old. They obviously don't booze on stage anymore as they would have done in the 80s and the early 90s. Um, but are we going to see a Brooks Kepka, Rory McIlroy type darts player um, unless the guy just happens to be a gym monkey? Absolutely not. Okay. 
Uh, the news round is brought to you this evening with Screwfix. E champion in the trade, a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. Richie, you're starting with news of Kieran Marmion. Yeah, another Ireland international that's facing a race against time to be fit for the start of the Six Nations. Marmion has been ruled out until February as the Connacht scrum half requires ankle surgery. The 26-year-old, it seems, picked up the knock or at least aggravated it during the test with Argentina, but he still started in Saturday last's victory over the All Blacks at the Aviva. Ireland skills coach Richie Murphy briefed the media today on Marmion's injury. Uh, sort of carrying an injury for the last couple of weeks uh, he's been fine uh, and been able to get through the games obviously no problem um, it happened I think it goes back to maybe the Ulster game uh, Connacht Ulster game and, and from that on he obviously uh, re-hurted uh, against Argentina so um, yeah he's, he, he, it's obviously a, a, a not great for Connacht because he's going to miss out for a couple of weeks but uh, it was felt that it's the right time to just get him f fixed up and, and, and ready for what's coming up in the new year. Thoughts on Saturday? It was phenomenal, wasn't it? It was just amazing. I watched, I watched, I didn't, couldn't see it live because I was working on uh, the Nations League at the time, but um, yeah. What was that like? <laughs> well, I, I saw a pretty good game. I was doing Italy-Portugal for Virgin Media that night. It was a good game. Yeah. It wasn't as good as sitting down at home with a couple of beers to watch Charlotte beat the All Blacks. Did pulling a sickie cross your mind? First time in Dublin. <laughs> no, of course not. But uh, I did manage to watch it um, twice over in the last 48 hours. And uh, it was, even knowing the result, it was just great fun to watch. Mm. And what uh, struck me, particularly in the second viewing the most, was it really was far from the perfect performance. I know you guys discussed on Monday Night Rugby yeah. with Brian and Eddie last night, and you put it to Eddie, was this the most perfect performance you've seen from an Irish team? And he said, yeah, bar maybe the one over England at Croke Park in 07. But I don't think it was perfect. I think the good thing about what happened on Saturday is that there are plenty of areas that they can improve upon. Most complete, I think, was the phrase. Right, most complete. Yeah. Only it wasn't really complete in that... They still have a line-out that doesn't fully function without Devon Downing. Yeah, I think our ability to win our own line-out five metres from the try line is isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. And the absence of both Toner and O'Mahony for the second week running is clearly an issue when it comes to line-out time. When they're not on the field, the line-out doesn't function as well. Now, I don't know how much of that has entered the throw. Does it make a difference in the lifting? Defensively, obviously, O'Mahony's just phenomenal at the very front of the line-out. Mm. No matter where you put Toner, he's going to be effective because he's just so incredibly tall and he's got a great leap. So, look, there's a very good chance that one or both may not be on the pitch when you need them at some stage in Japan yeah. next year. But isn't that true of any team? I mean, if uh, Vitalik and Whitelock go, the New Zealand line-out's not going to oh, be yeah. as good. I mean, every team <laughs> can't be perfect. Can you think of a more complete Irish performance? Um, I thought... Uh, now, you have to qualify it with the level of the opposition at the time, but the win over France in the World Cup in 2015 was an absolutely phenomenal display because we, I had grown up watching us get a proper beating off France with regularity, and we really just showed how much of a gulfing class there was. Between but that, that French team that is on, that, I mean, that French team is kind of yeah. at a lowest air That French team went on to get an awful beating off New Zealand yeah. in the quarterfinal. So, as I said, take into account the opposition that day. So what would have happened to that French team on Saturday? They would have lost by 20 points. Possibly, yeah. 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 I just, I, it wasn't complete. It was an incredibly good performance. Our accuracy in defence was brilliant, albeit yeah. still we fell off one or two tackles. I thought the box kicking um, from the scrum halves could have been better. Kick chase could have been better at times. Um, but, like, to, to come off the field knowing that you were the better team today, mm. but beyond question, mm. and that you kept this team, the double world champion, scoreless for the first time in the Northern Hemisphere for, what, 23 years? And it's just an unbelievable achievement. And there were some moments in the game that really just had you roaring at the TV, even watching it second and third time. Like that moment when, was it Ben Smith was bundled into touch by Johnny Sexton mm. and Jacob Stockdale and Sexton, he's like fist a pumping. fist pumping, like yeah. a tipperary halfback after mm. winning a free in the mm. first 90 seconds of a Munster Hurling Championship match, nearly jumping into the crowd. The crowd that was just amazing to see. Yeah. Bundy Aki looked every inch an Irishman for pretty much the entire game. The way he was um, interacting with his teammates, the way he was interacting with, his, with the crowd, you could see him with his family after the game. There was just so many other. Oh, there's no doubt he's moments. committed. Now that doesn't still sway me on the residency rule, but there's no doubt Bundyaki is fully committed. Ah, oh, like, uh, as, is, as is the case with Standard, pretty much anyone that's kind of qualified to play sure. for us through the three-year residency rule. Um, but I think, I think there's room for improvement. What I, I can't get away from, and I said this when we had Brian in on a Friday a few weeks back, you know, if everything goes as we would expect the form lines to go and we end up playing South Africa in a World Cup quarterfinal, mm. if you take away the level of talent that was taken away for the Argentina game in 2015 for that game, 
So the equivalent being we lose Sexton again. Maybe we lose Murray. We lose two of our back row. We might lose a fullback. We, I think we still lose. No matter how much depth we think we may have now, mm -hmm. I think we, if South Africa are in better fettle than we are personnel-wise, injury-wise, I think we still lose. You get to a World Cup quarter-final against a Southern Hemisphere team and you lose a third of your first-choice 15, yeah. you probably still lose the game. That's true of most teams. Are South Africa here at full strength or do they also lose a third of their team? In this in this hypothetical yes. situation, well, the seems Argentina a bit unfair, seems a bit unfair that you're ripping a third of our team out and you're just automatically giving them full strength. Well, I'm just comparing it to what happened against Argentina yeah. when they were pretty much full strength. Yeah, and we lost our playmaker. We lost Sean O'Brien through suspension. We lost Peter Mahoney. We lost Tommy Bow. We lost the greatest forward we've ever had in the history of the game, Paul O'Connell. Like, there's just no way to come back from that. So if you take James Ryan out of the team, Who are you take taking? Sexton out Ryan, of the team, Sexton. Um, so, say if you're taking Sean O'Brien, the equivalent now would probably be Peter O'Mahony, who we also <laughs> lost that day. Yeah. Um, take Stockdale out of the team because Tommy Bow was our strike runner that day. Um, Jared Payne was gone. So you're taking your best defensive midfield player out of the team, which at the moment is probably Gary Ringrose, who was superb in that yeah, department on Saturday evening. Like that's a third of the team gone. I would still back that team more so to beat South Africa than I would the 2015 version to cope. Much stronger, much deeper team. Yeah, we're now. feeling very good about ourselves now. But I mean, do you go and through so go through the players then. I mean, the back row, you would fancy that they'll cope. It's not ideal. No one wants to lose uh, Peter O'Mahony. Yeah, there obviously. is enormous strength and depth in the back row. Yeah. I okay, so I mean, our, our third choice number seven did rather well on Saturday. And our fourth choice came off the bench and had a big impact as well in Jordy Murphy. But by all means, if you're going to keep arguing against yourself here, that would help me. <laughs> uh, so we lose Devon Turner, it's a massive concern, obviously. But there's a fair Johnny amount Sexton. of fair amount of depth in that second row. Are you is Joey Carberry going to be fully equipped to now Ian another Madigan year, didn't another have year, that bad a day. A, another year under his belt and Carberry will be in decent fellow. Like Johnny Sexton's on the cusp of winning world player of the year. <laughs> you know, of course it's gonna be important. There's just no way to diminish that. We won't no team would be the same uh, without their very best player. Yeah, Conor Murray's just won Midi Olympiques best player in the world as well. So we essentially got the best three quarters in the world. Yeah. And the All Blacks <coughs> were beaten without Take Murray. them out of the team. Yeah, we, well, we did on Saturday. There was no Murray. There was no Sean O'Brien. Yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But we had Sexton. Okay. I don't think you can overestimate what he is bringing to us. Okay. However, if you take the best player from any team, they will be diminished. Yeah. Okay. And if you take six of them out, it's a struggle. <laughs> Jesus, and that's what, what are you doing with that side over that's what what happened. Japan? I'm just saying that's what happened in 2015. Yes, but would you agree we're, we're, we're at, the, um, at the risk of boring everyone? Are we in better shape? Yes. Should we encounter a, cri yes. a crisis of similar proportions? Yes. You would hope so. Oh, we are. You would we hope clearly so. Clearly are. We are, come on, Dave. The last four years, everything Joe Schmidt has done has been underpinned about... Uh, every, it, it, making the team um, have more depth has underpinned yeah. every, everything Schmidt has done in the last four years. Yeah, it's you like, would, it's you like would he, hope that we have better depth in every position. Yes. It's like he flew home in 2015 and all he thought about in the flight home was, over the next four years, if I do nothing else, I'm going to build that. Yeah, that's not going to happen again. And look, case in point, Joey Carberry's moved to, to Munster because Ian Madigan just was not playing enough game, games at 10 no. for Leinster at the time. And didn't you get that sense when Carberry came in on Saturday? I'm quite glad he's getting game time at Munster all of a sudden. Oh, of course. Yeah. And that he's taken to the Munster experience so quickly and so well. Um, I would be less worried now if we lost Sexton in that game. But and I do remember in 2015 thinking, Ian Madigan is going well. Like mm. He kicked his goals against France brilliantly. There was a couple of pressure ones that he had to make when the game was kind of a contest after Sexton had gone off. <clears throat> um, and I thought Madigan would, get, would be able to get the job done for us. But it was the sheer cumulative effect of missing so many guys. Don't forget that it's a double impact when you lose that many of your first choice 15. Not only have you lost them, you've also lost the next six off the bench. Yes. And that is a, in the way the game has gone now, for the last 20 minutes, that is absolutely crucial. Okay. So you suddenly don't have these boys come in. I'm, look, I'm agreeing with minutes. you. I'm just politely saying if any team loses their six best players, they won't be as good. If South Africa yeah, lose their six best. That's what I was best, saying at the start. And we lose our six best, I think we'd probably beat them. Oh, look, if it's evened up on the other side, yeah. this conversation is completely irrelevant. The problem <laughs> was... <laughs> it is <laughs> anyway, Dave. For some time. <laughs> the problem was in 2015, yeah. Argentina were in great nick. Yeah. I mean, that that's just a, that can be a bit unlucky, that was a that's bit, that, unfortunate. Yeah, that was unfortunate and I'm just saying like if something similar happens again, there would be problems. The other thing about the South Africa game is like we're all we, all, all we want to talk about is this World Cup semi-final, could we get to meet the All Blacks in a final? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have made massive improvements under Razi Erasmus since he's come in. Yeah, it's true. And they have had a very good um, November, should have beaten England, yeah. and the victory in Dunedin, or in Wellington against the All Blacks was... Impressive. 
and they should have beaten or could have beaten them the following week as well. So. I was talking to a Munster player who worked under Erasmus and he said, wait and you see come World Cup time. Yeah, they're going to have another year yeah. to, to, to prep. Um, they don't necessarily have huge strength and depth, so they're one or two bad injuries away from having problems. The other question is actually six. Just, you let alone six. Us with. I was talking to somebody else today. Why, why not talk about Ireland with 12 injuries? Yeah, well, we'll get it. We'll make a quarter final. Would you prefer to face New Zealand in a quarter final or a final? Final, because then we've got to a final. But we're talking about winning this tournament. No, I, I mean, if Ireland get to a final, it's a big success. If Ireland get to the final and are beaten by New Zealand, 28 points to 27. Yeah, it's a pretty successful tournament, all right. Pay per views I care less about. This is Tiger or Phil. <laughs> uh, someone says the Tiger versus Phil rematch next year, says Donald. Although Shane in Dublin says I care less about Owen Sheehan versus Tony McGregor, which is not the case in here. If there's a pay per view we care more about, I'd like to hear it. Than That's Tony the only McGregor thing in 2019 Sheehan. I'm looking forward to. That's the only thing we're looking forward to here. <laughs> I'll pay whatever the asking price is to, to see that. Uh, can't understand why Dave isn't on the radio every night. Absolutely love hearing him talk sports, says Steo in Dublin. Because he's a dose. Because uh, he's not bothered. <laughs> he's a cantankerous old devil. He's not bothered, Steo is the short version. <laughs> he's better than you, Steo. <laughs> Surely with his high protein diet, Dave McIntyre has used his bowels as an offensive weapon to unsettle an interviewee Jesus. at some point, says Gareth. Have you ever done that if an interview's not going well? Unleash hell. <laughs> oh God, I hate International Week. <laughs> Is that a genuine question or is it rhetorical? Why would you, Joe? I think it's genuine from Why Gareth. Why would you? <laughs> you just sit there talking to somebody and say, oh, this isn't going well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Get that, did you? So, that's um, shocking, that smell. <clears throat> let's move on. <laughs> Where are you going next? Uh, Republic of Ireland manager Martin O'Neill insisted his side were still making progress despite ending 2018 without a single competitive win. Last night's nil all Nations League draw away to Denmark was Ireland's fourth consecutive game without a goal, but O'Neill pointed towards the teenage debutant Michael Abafemi and the continued involvement of the likes of Ronan Curtis as reasons to be optimistic for the Euro 2020 qualifiers. And the manager says he still wants to continue in the job despite growing unhappiness at his reign. Robbie Brady caught up with Aaron Nathan after last night's game in Aarhus and insists there's no crisis of confidence in the squad despite the recent run of results. No, I don't think so. I think, like I said, it's been said probably a hundred times now about the, the massive change in squad and people getting to know each other. Um, it's the first time I've, I've played with a lot of these lads here this week um, and it's been the same, probably maybe getting that little bit better as the, as the trips go on. But like I said, still not good enough at the minute, but um, we're going in the right direction and, and, uh, and please God, some good results now after this. It's hard to share. Oh, look, it's very difficult. The players can't come out and What's say he what they really think. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. It is hard to share the sense that we're going in the right direction after 6.6 .6 hours, is the exact maths here, without a goal. 397 minutes, isn't it? Yes. Fun times. Yeah. Yeah, look, Robbie Brady, is, he'll say what he has to say, and and Stephen said what he had to say. Seamus Coleman's had a lot to say in the last week or two, but, I mean, Robbie's wrong. We're not going in the right direction. And Martin O'Neill said after the game that we have made progress. He's wrong. And this isn't like open to discussion. We have not made progress. It has been 12 months of regression. Mm -hmm. No matter what way you try to dress it up, you could possibly I say... We're not conceding four and five a game anymore. It's <laughs> a good one. Well, if your starting point is the defeat in Cardiff, you could say there's been progress made in the short term over the last month or two. But in the grand scheme of things, there's not progress. Well, you know, Martin after the game said that we, we have fixed things at the back, now we have to fix things at the other end. And we haven't really. Like Northern Ireland should have scored at least twice the other yeah. night. Um, the only reason we didn't concede against them was because they couldn't finish. And the Danes had a couple of guilt edge opportunities that they weren't able to finish last night. We have been, uh, we've been fortunate that we have managed to get out of the game against both the North and Denmark yeah, with a clean I totally chance. agree. Just because you didn't concede doesn't mean the defence was good. No. They gave up 26 chances last night. There was the use of pulse and one three or four, five yards out, where he just blasted over the bar. I mean, it's just luck, really, that they didn't concede <coughs> Ireland three chances, none on target. But if you give up 26 chances, that is not like you're keeping the opposition at bay. No. They are going right through you. They just haven't managed to finish. And the same with Northern Ireland. And this weird um, little thing of the, la of the last two games, Duffy last night giving the ball away as last man, and it happened again against Northern Ireland on Thursday, is just catastrophic. I don't know why that's happening. Well, I think that, I mean, Robbie was asked by Nathan, you know, is there a crisis of confidence? He said no. Well, again, he's obviously not mm. telling us the full story there because some of these mistakes are being made because the lads are incredibly um, fearful of making a mistake and they are low on confidence. Some of the um, balls that Daryl Lennon gave away on Thursday night, mm. that is not a guy who's fully confident in what he's trying to well, do. Wasn't it, wasn't it quite stunning how deep the Irish players were when they were passing there in the back last mm. night? Like, and any time any inroad into midfield was made, it was lost instantly. 
But I, I mean, they should have been 15 yards further. Even Keith Andrews made the point, if we're going to be passing it around like this endlessly, we need to at least be 15 yards further up the field. That's Maybe in the hope of drawing a man or doing or making something happen. That's something but actually, it was just, it, is the rugby equivalent of passing the ball, you know, 20 yards off the defensive yeah. line. It's and doing, then the doing problem nothing. is Denmark within 10 minutes cottoned, cottoned on to what we were trying to do. Yeah. And they, instead of us moving the 15 yards further forward, it was they that moved 15 yards further forward. It was the forward. slowest high press I've ever seen at certain points. They just started jogging very, very slowly towards the Irish defenders passing the ball on the edge of their own box. And within two or three seconds, it was back to Randolph and booted along. Yeah. We must be the easiest team to press in the world. There was, this came in in the late summer, early autumn, whereby there was a clear effort on O'Neill's part, it seems, to ask the team to pass the ball around mm. without any aim as to what that passing might entail or where it might lead. It was just, okay, we'll pass the ball a bit around now. And the next question was never asked. We'll um, talk to Ray Houghton in a few minutes. I get the impression, just looking at some of his comments today, he's certainly of the opinion this is more on the players than on O'Neill. So we'll bring you Ray Houghton very shortly. If there's a bit of a bright spark from last night, I suppose, it's that the uh, confusion over Obafemi's future has been cleared up. Yeah, Obafemi last night became the first Irish player born this century to make his international debut. That's something scary. And speaking to Sky's Guy, Guy Harvard after last night's game, the Southampton striker says there was never any doubt over his international allegiance. My mind was just focused on training because like, I knew where my allegiance stood, so... Um, it was more just the press that was just uh, putting the words in, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm here, so I'm happy, so yeah. You were always committing to Ireland? Yeah, I think that's. I think we all know that, but um, they're the only uh, country that represented youth level, so it was always Ireland, so yeah. I mean, respectfully, it wasn't the press, it was Martin O'Neill. <laughs> the press didn't just dream up that he might not play against Denmark or wouldn't go and play against Denmark. Yeah. That was Martin O'Neill in a press conference. So, I, yeah. like, did O'Neill talk to him? Did he not talk to him? I mean, I like it's such a small story at this point. It's over. It's done. But actually, how did O'Neill handle that situation? Because it seemed, according to him, a few days ago, he wasn't going to travel to Denmark. And then Obafemi is saying here, I was always going to play. I was always going to travel. It was never in doubt. Yeah. If if Michael Obafemi was always one hundred percent committed to playing for us, mm. I've no idea where this came from. Outside of Martin O'Neill raising that question in the press conference, will he be playing in Denmark? Well, you know, I'm not sure. Mm. It, Have you not asked the question? No. I, that, that is, I'm really curious to know well, how it was botched He called him into so the badly. squad without knowing for himself whether or not he was going to be an Ireland player going forward. Whereas in Nobifemi's mind and in his agency's mind, this is never an issue. So there's clearly some shortfall there on behalf of the manager who never asked the question. I think it does just suggest some kind of miscommunication, which you well, know, maybe I also hints, hints understand. a bigger issue. A miscommunication means it was a mix-up or a mistake. I mean, like, O'Neill just clearly didn't ask somebody and was left answering questions in front of a press conference despite the fact he didn't know the answer. Which is ridiculous. Well, it certainly put a spotlight on him that he didn't need at 18 mm. years of age in the squad. I mean, he was clearly conscious of the press talk because he's mentioned it there. Like, see, like, that's, so. what, that's what was really galling today is like, oh, he's put to bed any questions about his future. It's like, Michael Obafemi never raised any questions about his future. Mm. He should never have been put in that position. I couldn't understand the 10 minutes last night either. In a game that dull, in a team that is so horrifyingly st- bad in, in terms of creating chances at the moment. Mm. Why give this guy who, after so much talk about him in the build-up, why give him 10 minutes? Give him 20, 30, 35 minutes. Let's have a look at what this guy can do because mm. the problem is, given his lack of game time at St Mary's, God knows when we're going to see him again. Well, in fairness to O'Neill there, because this can just seem like a proper ganging up on him, he did say in terms of international football, it's uh, lovely for him to get on, but I think he knows himself he has plenty to do. To do. So perhaps he's seen enough in training to suggest that this guy's still very raw and 10 minutes is just enough. Let him get on, let him get his cap, let us put that to bed. But maybe O'Neill has seen enough to think that he's raw because he did say it in separate interviews. He still has a bit to do. So well, maybe see, that's the logic. I mean, O'Neill's same interview in Virgin Media last night, he was asked, you know, did, did Michael show enough that he could change things when you threw him on? And he got a bit antsy about the suggestion that he was thrown on to change things. But with the game still at nil all, and you're after throwing on your third separate striker, I mean, you're surely asking for him in some ways to change the game and score a goal or create a chance. You're not sticking him on just to stick him on. I just feel if Martin O'Neill did anything, you'd be on his case. In fairness. <laughs> like, you know, I think, I think we have to be fair to a point. Like, getting Nancy, what did he do? He was like, what did you, no, he got Nancy saying, how, how do you expect him to change the game? What's he going to do? I'm like, well, what are you sticking him on for? 
What's anybody doing out there? Well, he might have stuck him on as an 18 year old to get his debut, get try and get comfortable and, you know, bigger games ahead. And obviously it locks him into international future. Which he might, he mightn't have, he might which have stuck him on. Which O'Neill said he's never going to do. And, and Fair enough. But he, railed against. he mightn't have stuck him on with the pressure of go and change the game kid. You know, yeah, I just, I, I just think we have to be a little bit fair here. I don't think this is something you can criticise O'Neill over. I just would have liked a little more than 10 minutes, just so he could actually try and get a foot no, fair enough, in the game. And, fair enough. and maybe get his foot on the ball once or twice, because it was obviously an incredibly difficult day for anyone that was going to be playing up front. No matter what, pick the great Irish strikers of by, a bygone eras, and they would have struggled to have an impact in the game I think yesterday. Ronald Curtis probably deserved to get on ahead of him, given his form this season. The fact that he actually played games. Yeah, well, Curtis goals. probably deserved to start, really. He yeah. is probably our form striker. Um, like, I have a list of names here that, you know, could be playing for Ireland in the next six months. Mm -hmm. um, James O'Carthy, uh, Seanie Maguire, Matt Doherty, Kieran Clark, Stephen Ward, Shane Long, John Walters, James McLean, David Myler, Harry Arter. That's ten. That's practically a team that weren't involved last night. Mm -hmm. uh, for varying reasons, obviously, McLean was suspended. Like, I think our best eleven is still a good team. Well, that's O'Neill's point, and he reiterated it last night. He's like, he's very confident about the qualifiers starting next month. We'll have our big players back. They've done it before in big games. It'll be a clean slate, all that kind of stuff. And our best eleven managed properly is it is a force to be reckoned with against the majority of sides outside of the absolute elite, like the French and mm. the Spanish, for example. Um, but are um, they go are they going to be managed as best they can be managed? And you know, Martin Neal is telling us that you just will you wait. Mm. I'm confident, as he mm. said, after the uh, the games against Denmark and Wales at the Viva Stadium, I'm confident we will win. I am a winner. Yeah. Um, you just have to have faith. Um, I'm pretty certain that we've no alternative but to have faith in Martin and what he's able to do and produce in March. The problem is just on the body of evidence of the last 12 months, you wouldn't hold out much hope of that happening. Mm. But he and Roy Keane and the rest of the manager team are going to be there for the start of the Euro 2020 qualifiers. So let's hope Martin is able to reproduce some of the incredible results that Ireland have achieved under his management because uh, he has shown he can do it. Yeah. But I, right now, I'm just not confident that it's going to happen. No, it's the general sense, all right. Do you want to um, work on over time here just to update on the boxing? Yeah, Amy before. Broadhurst says her quarterfinal loss at the World's Women's Elite Boxing Championships in New Delhi today was a bitter pill to swallow. The Dundalk Light Welterweight lost on a controversial majority decision to injuries Simranjit Kaur and in the process misses out on a bronze medal. Broadhurst was denied a point for what appeared a clear knockdown and was also docked a point in the third round for what the referee deemed a slapping. The 21-year-old uh, feels it was always going to be tough to beat an Indian fighter at a tournament being held in India. The host nation, for what it's worth, have four representatives in Saturday's semi-finals. Kelly Harrington's day was far more straightforward. The Dublin lightweight guaranteed at least a bronze following her unanimous decision win over Canada's Caroline Vera. And Harrington will return to the ring on Thursday for her semi-final with Kazakhstan's Karina Ibramagova. Cheers. That's your news round for this afternoon. Ray Houghton's going to talk to us and give us his take on things next. Off the ball on News Talk. Thanks to Screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products.